right. Good day again, everyone. Thanks for joining this session. Again, if you've just came into the room, this session is on promoting responsible and climate smart investments in agriculture in Southeast Asia through the multi-stakeholder approaches. We will begin in a minute. All our panelists is here and we welcome our colleagues from the different regions and organizations, especially on the in ASEAN. Welcome. Good evening to all of us here in Southeast Asia. All right. I think we will begin on time for today's session. Thanks again for joining. This side event is part of the 50th session of the Committee on World Food Security, CFS 50, happening this week. And in today's session, we will get to talk about investments in food, agriculture, and forestry sectors in the ASEAN, specifically on the implementation efforts of the ASEAN guidelines in promoting responsible and climate smart investments. The ASEAN guidelines in promoting responsible investments in food, agriculture, and forestry represents the first regional iteration of the Committee on World Food Security's principles for responsible investments in the agriculture and food systems. These principles are being streamlined among the various sessions this week and during the global thematic event right after this session. We are very fortunate today to have with us representatives from the ASEAN Secretariat, ASEAN member states, the private sector, and the civil society to share their experiences in responsible and climate smart investments. And this side session is co-organized by the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, FAO, Grow Asia, International Institute for Sustainable Development, and the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture. All right, now before we officially begin, I uh, realized there is a bit of housekeeping video shown earlier, but if you've missed that, uh, if you've seen some spots here and there, I'd like to walk you through today's agenda and a reminders as well for some housekeeping. Allow me to share my screen. Mm. Yep. Hopefully everyone can see it in a presentation mode. Awesome. Great. Oh, let me go back a few slides up. Apologies for that. Yep. All right. And Today's session, we will start off with a key message from the ASEAN, Association of Southeast Asian Nations Secretariat, followed by a scene setting for this session. And next is a panel discussion. As mentioned earlier, we have representatives from the ASEAN member states, the private sector and civil society. And we will then open the floor to questions from the audience. So feel free to leave your questions on the chat. And finally, we will end with a brief closing statement and key messages for this session. All right, some ground rules. No, not ground rules, but just a bit of housekeeping. You know this by now, we're all in Zoom for the last three years, but please uh, rename yourself in the format you see on the screen. That is name and your organization in parentheses. This is so we can address you properly during the session. All right. And keep yourselves on mute unless you're acknowledged to speak during the open forum after the panel discussion. You can use your raise hand function to raise a virtual hand when you want to speak, but please note that we will get to be acknowledged during the open forum later on after the panel discussion. If you are having technical issues, you don't know where the buttons are, you can also send a private message to Maria Baral from IASD. Maria, give them a thumbs up or uh, send a chat message so they know who you are. If you can't access the participants list, then you can see her in the chat. Thank you. 
And this session has also a French interpretation option. So just click that globe sphere button down below to shift from English, which you'll hear me, and shift to French. And this session, as you've noticed, is being recorded so that the purposes of sharing the highlights, discussions, and learnings that we will have here today. All right. I'll stop here. Great. Now, before we move to the first part of the session, uh, I'd like all to ask everyone to open their cameras. Let's take some quick photos to show how many people are here in this session today. Let's do that very quickly, page by page. All right, open up your cameras. You'll have to smile for uh, quite some time because we'll need to take a lot of uh, pages for this one. <laughs> All right, here we go. One, two, three, smile. All right, next page. Smile. Hold on. <laughs> Let's make sure we got all of that. I'm in page three, by the way. So <laughs> Two more to go. Oh, wow, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces as well by page. Welcome everyone. Show those pearly whites while we take a picture. And final page, smile. If you haven't opened your camera, up oh, too late. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks everyone for opening your cameras. And now I see some familiar faces indeed and organizations here in the room. All right, before that, um, let's do a quick poll as well to know those that we're not so familiar with at the moment. Sean, thank you so much. So we'd want to know what type of organization you represent today. As we've mentioned earlier, this session is on multi-stakeholders. So we want to see if we are well represented as well for the session. All right, if you can't see the poll, don't worry, I will read the question, what type of organization you represent and the choices are civil society, government, private sector, multi multilateral organization, and others. If you don't belong to those and you're in others, just put it in the chat. And if you can't access the poll, you can slip on the chat box as well for your answers. Great. We're at a good percentage, I think almost 80% of people are still tuned in. So that's good. All right. All right. Thanks, Sean, for sharing the results. So I see we have a good mix of representatives today. All right. Great. Now we've officially start with our the first part of this session to introduce that the implementation of regional guidelines is made possible through the coordination and support of the ASEAN Secretariat by sharing recommendation and outcome to the ASEAN Technical Working Group on Research and Development. And I would like to welcome uh, Pat Dian Sukmajaya, a Senior Officer of the ASEAN Secretariat to share his opening remarks. Over to you, Pat Dian. Thank you very much, uh, Krisa. Good evening and good morning, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen. I am Dian, Senior Official in Food, Agriculture and Forestry Sectoral Develop, uh, Development Directorate, ASEAN Economic Community uh, Department of the ASEAN Secretariat, on behalf of Head of Food, Agriculture, and Forestry Division, Dr. Pam Kuang Min of the ASEAN Secretariat, I would like to express sincerely gra gratitude to the organizer to invite the ASEAN Secretariat to this, uh, to this uh, event of the Committee World Food Security on promoting responsible climate smart investment in agriculture in Southeast Asia through multi-stakeholder approach. Indeed, it is a great pleasure for me, uh, also for the ASEAN Secretariat, to be part of this dialogue 
as you may be aware, ASEAN has put food security on top of priority for regional cooperation and promoting responsible investment is also of our priority. At this important event, I would like to emphasize the current guidance from the ASEAN Ministers on Agriculture and Forestry on priority cooperation in the food, agriculture, and forestry sectors that include promoting sustainable and circular agriculture. The second is promoting to reduce harmful chemical use in agriculture sectors promoting nature-based solutions in agriculture and forestry and also for climate action. The fourth is addressing the carbonization effort of which the ASEAN is now facilitating dialogue to develop the ASEAN strategy for carbon neutrality. And last but not least, to enhance the use of digital application technology for agriculture and forestry sector. On that, Priority areas, the ASEAN Secretariat has been tasked to engage with partners in mobilizing resources for successful implementation and timely deliver of the activities. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, in this good occasion, I also would like to highlight some regional policy framework that are important to strengthen food security in the region, among others, the vision and strategic plan for ASEAN cooperation in forestry, and then the ASEAN Integrated Food Security and its Implementation Plan, the ASEAN Multisectoral Framework on Climate Change, Agriculture and Forestry Toward Food Security. Based on those broad framework, the ASEAN has been developing relevant policies and reference for ASEAN member states, such as the ASEAN Guideline for Promoting Responsible Investment, of which this has become uh, one topic we are going to discuss. And then the ASEAN guideline uh, framework in promoting climate smart agriculture. We have already uh, from volume, developed from volume, volume one to volume three. And then the ASEAN private, public private regional framework for technology development in food, agriculture, and forestry so sectors. Those policy framework have been an important references and guides ASEAN member states in enhancing resilience to the adverse impact of climate change. Those framework, as you may be aware, aware, were developed in partnership and also with support technical with our technical dialogue partners, as, such as Switzerland through the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, and also Germany through some projects such as the ASEAN Swiss Partnership on Social, Forestry, and Climate Change from Switzerland, GAPCC, Climate Smart Land Use, and Agri Trade. We are also delighted and recognized. Technical support from our partners from Grow Asia, IISD, Climate Resilient Network, GAXA, and also FAO. I think, uh, apology if I miss uh, to mention, but more partners are engaged with our dialogue in ASEAN in promoting uh, climate smart agriculture as well as uh, promoting responsible investment in ASEAN. Ladies and gentlemen, currently our sectors with support with the EU through EREBI program and GRZ through the Agri-Trade project is also working on study related to decarbonization in food, agriculture, and forestry sector. I do hope that the site even also could uh, open the discussion on this uh, area because it's also related to the responsible investment when we touch upon the carbon neutrality areas. Study on the carbonization of the ASEAN agri and forestry sectors supported by GIZ and also uh, the, study, uh, the carbonization dialogue, policy dialogue supported by the IREDI. We also continue exercise with the alignment of the ASEAN guidelines for responsible investment in some countries. I do uh, really hope that Indonesia could share with us on the progress of this exercise with the support of IISD and also with uh, our partners from, from Grow Asia. Uh, we invite more partners to engage with ASEAN in those uh, priority areas that becomes a uh, priority as guided by the ASEAN leaders on sustainable and circular ag agriculture, promoting nature-based solution, decarbonization, and reduce harmful chemical in agriculture sector. Again, thank you to all partners, to all organizers uh, that invite the ASEAN Secretariat to this very important site event. Uh, I could not mention one by one, but uh, I believe that uh, with the strong partnership, we are going toward the right direction. 
We believe that in the near future, we could engage more robust partnership with all partners and private sectors. With that, I would like to thank to all participants and also organizers, and I'm del delighted to open this site even uh, formally. Thank you very much. Back to you, Krisa. Thank you so much, Patian, for opening that up for us. There are a lot of great uh, priorities under the ASEAN already that was mentioned, and some of it will be reflected as well in today's discussion. We have nature-based solution, climate action, digitalization, and decarbonization, to just name a few of that. Now, to set the scene for today's session and really park some important questions and also challenges that we wanted to address with, uh, with us is Ms. Dada Bakudo from the ASEAN Climate Resilient Network and GAXA to share, to set the scene for today's session. Over to you, Dada. Thank you very much, Borge. And can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. <laughs> okay. Let me just pull out my and 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 thank you very much, uh, Pat Dian, for some of the reminders, especially on decarbonization, uh, that I know both of us will be embarking on. So, as we all know, this is my pleasure, as part of ASEAN Climate Resilience Network and GAXA, to some to set some of the scene and to introduce why we are doing and why we are promoting responsible and climate smart investments. As we all know, agriculture plays an important role in the economy of the countries of Southeast Asia. Yet, member states of ASEAN are highly vulnerable to adverse climate impacts and irresponsible or unsustainable practices. However, various innovative and practical agriculture solutions have already been piloted, such as agro-advisories, participatory community-based approaches, technology-based farm information, and financial management technologies in support of transformative changes in the food systems, contributing directly to the Paris Agreement and the Sustainable Development Goals. So amidst this backdrop, we make the case that increasing responsible and climate smart investment in food, agriculture, and forestry is very crucial to continue sustainable development within our region. It might be not familiar to us, the ASEAN region attracts billions of dollars of investment in the food, agriculture, and forestry sector every year. And it is vital that the region continues to attract such investments, given that the sector's importance is very high as a driver of employment, poverty alleviation, and food security in the region. It's, it would be very easy to say, let's continue attracting such investments. But we all know that there are many environmental, social, and governance risks and challenges associated with continuously attracting such investments. Moreover, there are so many barriers to scaling up innovative, sustainable, and climate smart investments. This include, and I would like to mention some of the barriers, risk and burden to farmers in adopting new sustainable, climate resilient, and low emission practices. There's also fragmented planning and monitoring of field level measures. And there's also the low capacity to actually access finance and leverage private sector engagement. So within this rationale, countries in the region, uh, ASEAN member states have called for further collaboration to address these barriers in the hope of continuously generating positive socioeconomic and environmental impacts, such as improved food security and nutrition, better protected ecosystems, and more sustainable use of natural resources. And we believe that responsible and climate smart investments will be able to address that so that we can address the impacts of climate change and that we continue to respect human rights and the rights of local communities. So therefore, in support of uh, Pat Dian's opening, ASEAN, through several of its technical working groups, have developed guidance on how to promote responsible investments in agriculture, such as the ASEAN Responsible Investments for Agriculture Guideline, how to promote climate smart agricultural practices, as Pat Dian mentioned, volumes one, two, and three, and even the lesser talk about um, guidelines to attract public-private partnership 
for technology in the FAF sector. And we know that these guidelines exist as member states called for further regional collaboration to address these barriers in the hope of making their food systems and agriculture sector more resilient, efficient, and sustainable. Beyond guidelines, countries of Southeast Asia have recently proposed to the Green Climate Fund to undertake a collaborative project that builds capacities of the agri-food system to attract climate smart investments by building science-backed science business plans. This, make, this successful grant makes it one of the very first, one of the very first regional or multi-country and sectoral proposal to have been successfully granted. So regardless of how well these guidelines, plans, programs, and projects are designed, they will only promote responsible and climate smart investment if we do not have a well-coordinated and openness in collaboration. Let us remember that these guidelines exist as guidelines, but there are many similar initiatives, events, partnerships that are taking place within the region, and many are already rooted in the ground. So therefore, these guidelines uh, is the greater challenge for implementation of our guideline is really in coordination and collaborative action. Therefore, different stakeholder groups need to undertake specific actions to promote responsible and climate smart investments in the food, agriculture and forestry sector in ASEAN to ensure that the region's farmers, businesses and citizens benefit from these investments. How do we do this? We have some suggestions. The ASEAN Secretariat needs to continue to facilitate and support coordination around the implementation of regional guidelines and programs on responsible and climate smart investments at national level and work with partners who can circle back the lessons learned in parallel implementation. ASEAN member state governments need to reform domestic laws and policies to ensure that they are aligned with regional guidelines and with global principles on responsible and climate smart investments, and thereby create an enabling environment for such investment. In doing so, they need to address sustainable development objectives and build appropriate safeguards. Businesses also need to adapt their investment practices with regional guidelines and domestic legal and policy changes. They also need to consider de-risking their agriculture portfolios, take steps to implement their ESG commitments and to make use of new types of green and sustainable financing. Civil society organizations need to continue advocacy efforts from policy to field level to ensure that ASEAN member states and investors follow regional guidelines and that legal and policy reform governments make with respect to responsible and climate smart investments. They also need to engage within and in consultation with governments and investors and push for inclusive processes at local levels, including the engagement of women and youth in investment processes. They also need to drive efforts to ensure local communities are aware of and are able to exercise their rights in relation to investments in FAF. Sounds a lot, right, Borge? But then we'll start with what we have right now. Right now, we have a range of partner organizations who are working with stakeholders to support efforts to play their part and their respective roles in promoting responsible and climate smart investments in the food, agriculture, and forestry sector in ASEAN. We have right now, uh, with financial support from the Swiss, UK, and Japanese governments, the ASEAN Secretariat, IASD, Grow Asia, and FAO are supporting the implementation of a 10-year action plan to assist ASEAN stakeholders to apply the ASEAN RAI guidelines. Through this action plan, a range of innovative tools and approaches have been developed to support governments, parliamentarians, investors, and civil society organizations to fulfill their respective roles in promoting responsible investments in the sector. Also putting words into action, the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, the Global Alliance for Climate Smart Agriculture, the ASEAN Negotiating Group for Agriculture, together with FAO, 
have already moved towards addressing one of the key bottlenecks for scaling up appropriate innovative climate smart approaches. We are very happy that the group has secured climate finance to ensure that the agri-food sector is well equipped with sound business plans backed by climate foresight and agroecological zoning. And we are really looking forward to working with the science community, the civil society organizations, business and um, investment groups in order to get this going. I also would like to add as um, Dian has, Padian has mentioned several uh, priority areas of AMAF in the upcoming years for the sector and that decarbonization or carbon neutrality will be a sector that will specifically need special attention in investments as farmers will probably switch to more climate friendly approaches. So we're really looking forward to working with everyone given this background and setting the scene. Over to you, Borge. Thank you so much, Dada, for setting the scene for us for today's discussion. And as Dada already mentioned, uh, different stakeholder groups can undertake specific and valuable actions to promote and attract responsible and climate smart investments in the region. So it's not just one, but should be a co collaborative approach. And we are grateful to have these different stakeholder groups represented today. And our format is we'll call them on one by one so we can highlight discussions for the specific uh, partner, our stakeholder group represented today. Now, as mentioned uh, by both speakers earlier, the ASEAN member states are participating in an alignment assessment process to better understand how well their existing laws, policies, and institutions align with the ASEAN guidelines on promoting responsible investments in food, agriculture, and forestry, and thereby identify potential areas for reform. Now, Indonesia has had great progress so far. So let's put let's turn to Professor Irizal Jamal of the Indonesian Center for Agricultural Socioeconomic Policy Studies, who has been involved in the alignment assessment process. Good evening, Professor Irizal. Uh, good evening, boards. Yes, welcome yeah. for today's session. Thanks for joining us. Now, my question for you, Professor, is could you please tell us a bit about Indonesia's experience with the alignment assessment process? And if you can include some of the challenges that you have faced so far in the implementation and the benefits you've seen so far in the process. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Bert. Uh, thank you already give uh, opportunity to us to Indonesia to share our experience in assessment uh, of Asian guideline on uh, promoting responsible uh, investment in food and agriculture. Uh, Indonesia uh, conducted uh, assessment since October 2021. Uh, in the first effort, we try to understand and define uh, the guideline, especially a description of topic uh, for this, this activity. There are uh, 10 topic from uh, uh, food and nutrition security till uh, regional approach. And after that, uh, we try to identify uh, the focal point uh, internal, our Ministry of Agriculture, also uh, uh, among the ministry uh, that related with the issue or, or the, with the topic. Uh, for example, the topic of uh, land tenure, for example. So, in uh, in this uh, topic, we working together with the uh, Ministry of Forest, also for the National Land Agency. Uh, after we try to identify the focal point and we, we discuss about this uh, activity, we conducting uh, self assessment about the uh, status of a regulation and a policy measure. We do that and we conduct together and uh, we, we, we conduct some uh, focal group focal uh, group discussion uh, about this uh, issue. And in the last step, uh, we we try to discuss the result about the 
what we we get that from uh, we try to to mapping all of the uh, regulation and also policy measure and uh, we, we make an agreement about the degree of measurement uh, what we we conduct that and uh, there are uh, some choice uh, about the already fully alignment or partially and also make, you make a score it's really a very very interesting uh, activity among us uh, uh, under minister uh, among in indonesia what is the challenge uh, for this activity the first is uh, uh, the the first we try to give information to our friend in uh, among the minister is the lack of understanding about the this issue so uh, the lack of uh, understanding of counterpart regarding with this with this issue so the first effort is to make uh, to give the understanding what is the benefit from this uh, activity for us for indonesia and also uh, in the future what 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 we can we can get this uh, from this activity secondly is uh, uh, to how to make an agreement about, among the among us about the uh, the status regulation and policy measure the uh, some uh, minister mentioned there is not really uh, not really uh, alignment, but some mentioned they are already fully aligned-minded, and also for the, to to put the score about the status of the uh, measurement. Uh, this is uh, the the challenge we we, we face that. And what is the benefit uh, we get from this activity? Through this activity, uh, now Indonesia uh, we know that our position in relation with the regulation and policy in investment and on food and agriculture we already know that uh, what we already have regulation also the derivative uh, rule in uh, all, all topic of the guideline we, we already know about that and we know that what we must to do in the future uh, to to reform our regulation and to make uh, harmonize among us uh, for the some regulation uh, to make the investment in agriculture and Food will Indonesia will be better in the future. This is all about what your your question to me. Uh, give back to you, Boris. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Rizal Jamal, for for that answer. And actually, there are a couple of representatives from different ASEAN member states, uh, governments, and ministries uh, in the call. So I encourage you to ask your questions for Professor Jamal on what the alignment assessment process has been, if and there are any specific questions, I encourage you to put that in the chat. Thanks again, Professor Jamal. Okay, you're welcome. All right. Now, another role, so that's one role of the government on policy alignment and processes. Another role that the government can play is the implementation of specific projects and programs that encourage responsible practices like climate smart agriculture. Now, ASEAN agriculture, as mentioned by Dada earlier in setting the scene, is transitioning towards low emissions and resilient agri-food system. And there is still that lack of financing and investments in best practices that have been identified as a major challenge. Now, to respond to this, the ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, which is Malaysia is a founding member, has taken the steps to secure financing from the Green Climate Fund in order to build capacities to attract investments and have business plans guided by climate foresight. Now, we have today Mohamed Hariz bin Abdul Rahman from the Malaysian Agricultural Research and Development Institute with us today. Uh, Dr. Harris. Hi, boys. Yeah, I'm here. Yes. Good evening. Okay. Um, welcome evening. and thanks for joining in this session today. Now, right. we're going to talk a bit. You're going to share a bit about this Green Climate Fund. So can you tell us more about this grant that was awarded to the ASEAN member states? And what are the member states that has been awarded with the grant? And how would this actually address that investment gap towards low emissions and resilient agri-food systems? Packed question, okay. but over to you, Professor Ent. Um, actually, a bit of reminder, uh, you'll have 
five to six minutes to answer. So please go ahead. Thanks so much, Dr. Harris. Okay, thanks, Raj. Uh, first of all, thanks again for giving me the chance to speak on our experiences of being part of this uh, newly approved uh, GCF project. So as you mentioned, there are actually six countries, uh, Laos, uh, Malaysia, Vietnam, Myanmar, uh, uh, Philippines, uh, Thailand, and another country, let me, I forgot, the, uh, Cambodia, sorry, sorry, Cambodia for, for, <laughs> for the loss. Okay, it's okay, uh, it's, uh, six countries. So um, basically during the pandemic, in the past two years, there have been series and discussions about how we want to move forward uh, with the uh, ongoing uh, discussions on Corinivia John Wood on agriculture. And at the same time, we need to do a lot of things uh, and build investors' confidence in each country's uh, projects and uh, transformational climate change actions. So example is in, in order to build investor confidence, we need to build a solid uh, business plan. Okay? So these business plans are guided by the climate and demand foresight. So what we do, what we did is when we streamline our GCF project with the important elements uh, in KJWA, uh, we, we leverage the national, regional and global climate finance networks and policies to support uh, implementation of uh, country specific or national uh, climate actions. <clears throat> so eventually by means of leveraging, there are a few advantages that we get. Firstly, the process itself uh, benefits the stakeholders uh, in terms of the recognition, recognizable process, because they might get, especially uh, from the policies prioritized uh, by the government, normally it reflects uh, what happens at the national level uh, to the global level. For example, as what we are progressing right now on NDCs or even previously on, on CDM, for example. So another advantage is from this uh, uh, transformational of the policies is the there will be more benefits gained uh, from the financial plans created uh, from from this project uh, especially because therefore there will be private and public sector might might respond uh, positively to support eventually these comprehensive investment plans uh, that reflects uh, national policies yeah so although the project is about creating investment plans it is also a manifestation about the implementation of existing or new policy uh, in place related to agriculture climate change. So, so that's basically my answer to your question. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Harris, for that, for your answer and being on time. That's uh, <laughs> also a great news for us uh, in the session, no, but also a great news to have um, ASEAN some of the ASEAN member states supported by this new GCF grant and is specifically focused on low emissions and resilient agri-food systems. Well done. Thanks for sharing with us. And um, as I've mentioned earlier, I noticed that there are some um, government representative and ministry representatives in the room today. So if you have any specific questions for both Dr. Harris and Professor Jamal, and also, if anything, from the earlier speakers as well, kindly put them in the chat. And I see some answer question and answer already ongoing. All right. Now we turn over to the private sector, which, is, which plays an essential role in agriculture investment. Now the sector is facing risk in climate change, among others. The private sector has to keep business growing and moving and is expected to align at the same time with responsible practices, such as the sustainable development goals and their own environmental, social and governance commitments. We are joined today by two private sector partners. I'll call on our first one, Kun Haitakan Kamol Sirisakul. Kun Kam, Group Chief of Staff, AVP for Strategy, Sustainability and Innovation of Taiwan Public Company. Uh, I'll give a bit of introduction as well on Taiwan. Now, Taiwan is an agri-food company in Thailand, incorporated in 1947. So it's their 75 year this year, uh, producing and processing tapioca products. Taiwan is operating in Vietnam, China, Cambodia, and Indonesia. 
and continues to explore sourcing locations in Southeast Asia. Their mission is to serve global customers while seeking ways to create innovative and sustainable farm to shelf. The company's core business is on tapioca starch and starch related products, as well as food products and biodegradable products distributed to local and international markets. All right. Welcome, uh, Kum Kam. Hi, Borch, and hi, everyone. Hi, Kam. Good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Now, I have actually a very general question um, for, for you. And if you could share with us Taiwan's experience, because I've mentioned earlier doing responsible business and also making the business work. And how is Taiwan's experience in both responsible and climate smart investments? Again, can come just a reminder, five minutes and <laughs> I'll let you know when your time is up. Or almost up. Over to you, Kun Kam. Ha. Thank you, Borch. Um, and thank you, everyone, for having me today this evening. Um, just a little bit more on Taiwan, uh, as Borch said, just to add on. Yes, we do have three core businesses. We're, you know, we're 75 year olds, and we've been expanding our portfolio not only locally in Thailand, but also internationally. So right now we're exporting to about 35 countries from our 15 operations. Uh, in five countries here in Asia Pacific. Um, within that, I think uh, one of the things that is an enabler for us and is very key to us is to be for us to be able to secure, um, create and create uh, innovation and sustainability from farm to shelf. So hence to that point, we have been building on four core strategic pillars for our sustainability framework. The first one is around farmer. So ensuring that uh, our farmers, uh, we're helping the farmers develop and we're building regenerative agriculture. On the second core pillar is around factory. So we're building green factory and green community around where we're touching base on. Uh, the third one is around family and well-being. This is around how our associates and the community that we serve as well. And the fourth one is around food and the finished goods. Um, I think specifically for the topic that we're um, talking about in terms of farm development and regenerative agriculture, if we kind of step back a little bit to the overall, linking to the overall climate change, I think, you know, on an annual basis, um, food as well as agriculture emits around you know, over 35, 30, 35% of the carbon emission globally. So we do feel that with us, you know, 15 operations in five countries in Southeast Asia, we're able to, and we do want to help catalyze in terms of controlling and decreasing the climate impact out of the food and the agriculture sector. So under this pillar about farm development, we're, you know, in the next 10 years, we're targeting to reduce um, scope three by 50% carbon emission reduction in agriculture. We want to improve the yield by about 20% for 100 million rice. So that's give or take close to 300,000 um, mm -hmm. hectares uh, in Southeast Asia. And we want to increase the income for our farming community um, by 50%. Some of the examples that we're starting or initiatives that we're starting now um, since last year is, for example, uh, working with 150,000 farmers here in Thailand to track uh, around, you know, the economics of the family. How do we improve the family life? What about the impact in terms of the uh, environmental impacts? For example, um, helping the farmers use less chemicals that will also improve their health, but also decrease the uh, carbon footprint as well. Um, another thing that we're doing, and I think this was a study that was um, we did together with Grow Asia last year. Um, Taiwan uh, is also building um, an organic supply chain out of Cambodia as well. Um, the organic supply chain, which we are currently doing, is around tapioca, and we were we're right now exporting to sending the tapioca to our factories in, in Vietnam. Um, within that, we're working with um, over um, 30,000, not 30,000, 10,000 farmers in Cambodia to build out the supply chain. We've, we've started this about uh, three, four years ago. And right now we're able to um, build um, quite good momentum in terms of um, persuading the farmers in Cambodia to plant organic. 
And part of the reason why uh, we're getting more traction around that is also because organic for farmers, they're able to get 50% uh, more versus the normal crop, the normal tapioca crop. So, you know, I personally went to Cambodia earlier this year and talked to the farming community that we worked with. The families had really good feedback in terms of, you know, they're really happy that they're able to grow um, by planting organic with us because that means they don't have to travel to other areas or other countries to work because the income from the organic tapioca has actually helped them be able to, to have better lives as well. And I think to Taiwan um, for the organic side, because we're you know, expanding our organic uh, plantation, which means that also we're helping the farmers use less um, chemical fertilizers. And at the end of the day, we're also tracking it, um, positively in terms of the carbon emission as well. So I think overall, there are a lot of initiatives that we're doing um, you know, for in the public sector, and especially in Southeast Asia. Um, in order to help uh, improve the, the, the carbon footprint here as well, Borch. Hopefully oh, that was five minutes or less. <laughs> Actually, it can come, you're right on time. Okay. I wonder how you did it. It's like almost, yep, thanks so much. I gave you, um, I was supposed to ask one minute wrap up, but then you're there. Great, thanks for sharing. Um, Taiwan's initiative can come on both the responsible investing side, but more importantly, on your goals in terms of um, net zero emission and a very realistic goal to reach in terms of scopes one, two, and three, and, and the farmer support uh, as well for the cassava production. I will put in the chat the case study that uh, Kun Kam has mentioned that we did together with Taiwan in their um, or organic cassava in Cambodia. I hope that helps everyone as well. Thanks, Kun Kam. Top Kun Ka. All right. And for those who are interested, again, the I linked, I posted the link in the chat for the case study on Taiwan. All right. Now another private sector representation for today, representing the small and medium enterprises. And I don't think that's a, a small but big in impact. I would like to introduce Ms. Sharon. Jean Gonzalez Gomatico from More Nation Agricultural Products. Evening, Ms. Sharon. I'll just give a bit of introduction about More Nation as well. Now, More Nation is a Philippine company operating across multiple supply chains, focusing on value chain alignment, food systems integration, and aiding rural communities towards sustainability and self sufficiency. The company strongly integrates social values to its business model and operations. And More Nation is also a member of the United Nations Global Compact, a UN private sector mechanism, Philippine Partnership for Sustainable Agriculture, a part of the Euro Asia Network. And More Nation is also an active zero hunger champion. Now, Ms. Sharon, good evening. Welcome again. I know you're a strong implementer of the ASEAN guidelines on responsible investments, as well as the CFS principles that were mentioned earlier. Now, I want to post this question on why are these guidelines important for SMEs such as yourself and how these investments relate to both the business side and commitment side, which is mostly focus on social, community, and environmental impact. Over to you, Ms. Sharon. Good evening from the Philippines, esteemed colleagues. Um, thank you for including Mori Nation in today's event, and thank you for the question, Borge. As a small company like Mori Nation, the CFS, ASEAN Responsible Agri-Investments, or the RISE Guiding Principles, have been our framework and have assisted us to where we would want to be as a company. As a global citizen, the RAI has been instrumental for us as we aligned our corporate goals with ecosystem development and the SDGs of Zero Hunger, No Poverty, Women Empowerment, and Climate Action. The ASEAN RAI has been an important roadmap for us that we could not imagine how our path would have been otherwise, a small company investing in people, the future, and ending global hunger despite our size. 
When we started applying the right principles in our company, we also lead the people pillar of the UN Global Compact Network in the Philippines towards small business recovery and resilience. Because of the RAI, we have the courage to take on this challenge as we're confident that we will have the support of the RAI community of partners. With this, the guidelines for us have evolved and become an articulate and interactive framework that we have merged with our sustainable business model because of the RAI learning series, the case studies reporting, monitoring and evaluation tools, and the Assay and RAI's dynamic and supportive community. As you mentioned a while ago, Mori Nation operates across multiple commodity chains, supporting the United Nations in their peace development and humanitarian efforts. Three of our current initiatives have adopted the CFS ASEAN RAI guidance in operationalizing our systems. First, together with the CFS, we are a business case and part of the private sector mechanism in developing guidelines for women empowerment in the global food systems. In our company, 90% of those in our ecosystem are composed of women and we recognize the roles and contributions in meeting our deliverables. With this, they are given an enabling environment to thrive in the areas of agriculture and trade. Women are not just in the labor-intensive farm production, but they are in all the areas of the ecosystem, from decision-making, marketing, sales, finance, sourcing, and quality management. Second is the Million Moringa uh, Movement. Our company, Mori Nation, is named after Moringa, the superfood. This movement aims to be a viable solution in fighting deforestation, hunger, and provide livelihood to the communities. The implementation of this is anchored on the right principles where we plant a million Moringa trees in each region. Mori Nation has been developing strong linkages for Moringa propagation in areas characterized by high incidences of poverty, unemployment, and unproductive lands. Despite the El Nino and typhoons, we have been consistently harvesting Moringa. When Taal Volcano decimated the agricultural sector surrounding it, including the area of the growers, the plants left standing and now thriving are the Moringa trees. The third initiative is, despite being a small corporation, Mori Nation is now leading the multi-stakeholder piloting of the UN Food Systems Transformation Agenda of Zero Hunger in the Philippines. The support of Grow Asia, UN, and the private sector in fighting global hunger and helping our communities grow and to scale these have been immeasurable. Working within an organization and getting the support of all members of the team to adopt the RAI is already a challenge, but with a blueprint like the RAI guidance, we use this to guide us in our operations. The importance of the RAI guidance becomes eminent when we work with various multi-stakeholders using the RAI as our main framework. Working in solidarity with others is especially important during these times for small businesses as we play on each other's strengths regardless of size and breadth. In the case of our Zero Hunger Coalition, Mori Nation's role is to put in the investment in the post-harvest facilities and ma maximizing the efficiency of our farms. Companies such as Nestle provide training support to our growers. Metro Pacific Investment Corporation and Manila Doctors Hospital provide nutrition, wellness, and health checks and interventions on our communities. ICM provides the marketing and procurement support to our harvest. Comunidad provides digitalization solutions and weather and climate advisories so that we can integrate climate smart systems in our farms. As Grow Asia's counterpart in the Philippines, PPSA conducts monitoring and evaluation of our compliance with the RAI guidelines. More so, they continually check on us and ask us what support they can provide on our, in our initiatives. With this, PPSA is collaborating with us in the development of nutrition agriculture programs for our growers for them to be effective food champions, enabling them to be our front lines in our fight against hunger. The coalition guided by the RAI are with us on the ground, ensuring that our growers can compete in the global market, conform to global standards, and are able to connect with buyers. Through the RAI, we focus on building the capacities of the growers and the communities through trainings, mentorships, partnerships, and healthcare as the communities sustainably manage and run their livelihoods, empowering the poorest of poor involved in the ecosystem's value chain. This also utilizes fair and sustainable trade mechanisms where the growers decrease on the prices of their harvest. In closing, responsible investing and local sourcing in the Philippines are a better option now 
rather than importation of goods given the current market conditions of record-breaking trade deficits, high cost of imported goods and logistics, the valuation of the peso against the US dollar, high inflation rates, the global disruption of the supply chain. Despite these, our small company is moving forward in our climate smart and responsible investments. With a rye and using sustainable business model, we can face and address ESG issues head on. Now is the time to invest, source local, empower women, provide stability in their livelihoods. Because the issues like poverty, hunger, and unjust food systems continue to persist and will not disappear by inaction. The CFS FAO ASEAN and RIE guidance continues to be a beacon in these stormy seas. With the RIE initiatives, it becomes more just and inclusive. Once it reaches critical mass, social, economic, environmental action impact is reached. Thank you. Over to you, Borge. Perfect timing. Thank you very much, Ms. Sharon, for sharing the initiatives and work of Mori Nation as we always say SME is a backbone of the economy and you're clearly... 99% of our companies in the Philippines are composed of SMEs. That is true and correct. And we see that this eff the, the efforts to align to certain guidelines and initiatives could build um, within a business model as well, as Ms. Sharon mentioned. Thank you so much, Ms. Sharon, for sharing... Uh, about Mori Nation and about your work and lots of initiative around responsible agriculture investing. Thank you so much. All right, and I'll pause for a minute to ask if anyone has um, keep the questions going on the chat. Uh, we're compiling it and some of our colleagues are actually also answering the questions as well. So if you have any questions from uh, for both Kunkam and Ms. Sharon, post it in the chat as well. So hopefully we can get through that to the Q&A later on. Now, we cannot uh, and we should not forget actually that there is one critical role in promoting responsible and climate smart investment that the civil society plays. Now the panel deliberately ends with an intervention from the civil society in addition to its key role in advocating for and raising awareness about responsible agricultural investment. It must be meaningful to engage in the work described by the government and the private sectors, whether in policy, policy review processes, consultations, or actual investments on the ground. And I would like to invite Mags Getindik. Good evening, Mags. Assistant Secretary General of Asia Draw. Asia Draw or the Asian Partnership for the Development of Human Resources in Rural Areas. Asia Draw is a regional partnership of 11 social development networks and organizations in 11 Asian nations that envisions Asian rural communities that are just, free, prosperous, living in peace, and working in solidarity towards self-reliance. Asia, Asia Draw is an affiliate entity of the ASEAN and also part of the Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism, or the CSIPM, for relations with the CFS, which is the largest international space for CSOs working to eradicate food insecurity and malnutrition. All right. Hi, Max. Good evening to you. Great. Thank you, Borge. And thank you for pointing out that the implementation and discussion on the on responsible agri investment cannot happen without the participation of civil society organizations. So thank you, Borge. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone from Manila. From Asia Dress Experiences, we are a network of rural development NGOs. And from our network's experience, as well from, as from the other CSOs initiatives that we know of or participated in, there are three important contributions that we have been doing. One is capacity development. The other is case documentation and studies. And very important, the popularization and localization to implement the ASEAN RAI. 
beyond campaigns and advocacy, as Dada mentioned earlier, Asia Dra believes that meaningful realization of these important guidelines, agreements, commitments, and policy instruments, however we call it, will only be achieved if strategic actions reach on ground and if it includes multi-stakeholder participation, especially of the rural communities. We recognize, though, that there is a need to capacitate our ranks, no? especially in constructive engagement or in partnership building with the public and private sectors, among many things. So, but so uh, since 2019, Asia DRA, in collaboration with the FAO, we have been investing in developing capacities of CSOs, farmers' organizations, and select government agencies. Uh, in Cambodia, Lao PDR, Myanmar, Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, especially in promoting youth and women's role in climate resilient and responsible agri-investments. These include capacity assessment workshops, training of trainers, learning sessions, among others. Several CSOs in the region, most of which are partners of ISHADRA, have also been conducting many awareness raising and capacity development among CSOs, FOs, and national government agencies. Along with these capacity building activities, Asia DRA has also invested in case documentation and scoping studies on rural youth and women's participation in agriculture investments. In 2018 to 2019, we did a regional scoping study on ensuring climate resilience of rural communities in Asia, which included a proposal for a community resilience rights framework. Though through this case documentation and scoping studies, which are all available on our website, by the way, through these studies, we have noted that several global and regional policy instruments, such as the ASEAN Right Guidelines, are not yet well known at the national and subnational level. So we still have a lot of work to do in promoting these important policy instruments. We have also mapped out several national and local initiatives or public programs on focusing on youth and rural women in agriculture. We found out that many of these initiatives still need integration of the CNRI guidelines in their implementations. So we have also organized multi-stakeholder dialogues and consultation workshops with private sector, with um, public sectors, uh, workshops on responsible and climate resilient investments, particularly focusing on empowering rural women and youth. All this capacity development, case documentation, popularization, and local activities have helped the participants internalize, internalize right principles and embed them in it in their work, particularly in their engagement with their respective governments, in the economic activities of the FOs or the farmers' organizations, and in lobbying and advocacy. As an example, Borge, at the regional level, Asia DRA was able to embed these right guidelines and strategies in the ASEAN Rural Development Poverty Era and Poverty Eradication Framework Action Plan for 2021 to 2025, and in the draft ASEAN and Rural Development Master Plan, where Asia Draco anchored the development processes with the ASEAN Secretariat. At the national level, some examples, um, some CSOs that we have trained were able to use their knowledge of RAI in contributing to consultation processes of their country's agriculture development plans and proposed laws. For instance, in the Philippines, in the drafting of the Magna Carta for Young Farmers, and also in the review of existing national policies, such as in Cambodia, the review of the contract farming law. So the capacity development activities have improved the skills and confidence of CSOs, especially of farmers' organization, in presenting their positions in, when dealing or negotiating with the public and private sectors. We were also able somehow, no, we were able to help popularize the ASEAN right principles among private sectors. For instance, in a workshop in Cambodia, a private sector representative inquired about the difference of the ASEAN right guidelines with the other many existing framework policies and laws. So our colleague in Cambodia, who is now a certified right trainer, was able to help clarify and explain further the important role of different stakeholders in implementing RAI. It is important that 
these different sectors are have the same it is important that we have the same appreciation or understanding of these important policies and frameworks or principles so George, these are there are more things that i can share beyond campaigns and advocacy but the three concrete contributions the capacity development case studies or documentations and the popularization and localization are some of the concrete contributions that cso's are doing or contributing in relation to asean rai implementation at different levels not only at the regional and national level, but especially at the local level. Over to you, Borj. Well done on time as well. Thank you so much, Max. I'm so happy for all of our uh, panelists today are doing great on time. It's very rare uh, to moderate this kind of panel, but well done. And thank you, Max, for, for tying up initiatives from the government, the private sector, and the important role of the civil society organization in actually pushing forward some of these activities as well. And great that you mentioned some of uh, the initiatives that were recognized by all of the partners in the region as well. We have Cambodia, some of our partners are also in the room today and some in the Philippines as well. So great to have that representation and concrete examples on the field. All right, well done. Now I want to, um, we have a few minutes to open up for a question and answer. Um, we might not be able to go through all of them. I have noticed that some of the questions were already answered by some of our colleagues. Uh, but if anyone wants to raise their hands and actually ask the question, you may do so. You have some time to do that. So I'll give everyone a minute or two to raise their hand while I'm checking as well some of the questions you posted on the chat. Or those who have posted it on the chat, you might want to ask it live directly to the panelists. That's okay as well. We welcome questions on the floor. All right. We have a shy group today, so I think I would just post the questions that were um, in the chat. One for, hopefully one for each panelist, but if not, then we'll move through. Um, I have one question, I think, specifically for uh, Professor Jamal in terms of, I don't know if you have answered this, but would you like to give some of the ministerial representatives today, the next steps for the Indonesian government after the self-assessment? And would it possibly include other stakeholders as well? Over to you, Professor Jamal. Okay, thank you, Bert. Uh, for, what for the next step for the Indonesia? Uh, we try to identify all of the results from the our first assessment, and we, we try to see that the higher the higher gap, uh, what is uh, are already in align, uh, alignment and uh, what what is still not uh, in alignment, and uh, we we try to uh, see that for the detail of uh, regulation and policy, and we uh, we make a priority to reform for in the future. Is the first uh, we we do that. Uh, secondly, we try to uh, identify the uh, investment risk of the Indonesia. Uh, based on this uh, assessment, we, we, we know that what is the, uh, the investment risk of the Indonesia and try to what uh, our mitigation process yeah. for, for that. And, and the last the lastly, uh, uh, we try to appoint it uh, one of the uh, institution to responsibility for the uh, investment in uh, under Ministry of Agriculture. Both. Thank you so much. Uh, okay. Yes, thank you so much, yeah. Professor Jamal. That was, um, yeah, very helpful. 
for the next steps. And I think that's a mostly multi-stakeholder approach as well for that self-assessment. So if anyone uh, on the ministries are also working on the alignment assessment tool, uh, post your questions as well. And the contact information will be shared as well after uh, at the closing end. Um, thank you. And I think I'll also ask um, one question here, both for the private sector, um, Kunkam and Ms. Sharon, um, either of you can answer. Uh, this is actually a really good question on the, what are the biggest risks and opportunities for your business with respect to climate smart investment? Don't go at the same time. So I'll probably call out, uh, come first because you're first on my screen. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> in, in in a minute, it, like a, a minute or two, if that's possible. Sure. Okay. So I go first or Sharon, would yeah. you like to? Okay. I, I think some of the, I think an opportunity, well, we see it as more of an opportunity. I think, uh, you know, we've, we've started sustain our sustainability journey quite many years ago. And now we're, you know, we're starting to gain sort of momentum with it. Um, you know, we export to 35 countries. You know, we do believe that we impact, we're impacting about 1 million customers globally right now. And we're seeing more traction in terms of customer inquiries about sustainability and carbon footprint uh, declarations and things like that. The thing is, what, what was interesting to me is we're not only seeing um, this Quest, these questions from US or Europe, but we're starting to see more from companies within Asia. So within Thailand itself, um, within actually from Philippines as well. Um, some of our customers in Philippines are asking about it. So I think, you know, that also has prompted us to, um, to sort of kind of validate that we're on the right track in terms of you know, climate smart investing, investing in a farming community to, to help um, improve uh, sustainable farming on that front as well. So I, I, I see it more of um, an opportunity. Thank you so much, Kangham. And Sharon? I think that's a very good question. Um, the risks and opportunities in um, investing in climate smart agriculture. Um, one of the investments that we're into right now is the use of organic fertilizers for our growers, um, because a lot um, around 70% of our growers are organic farmers. So we have to use organic um, fertilizers for them. And uh, one of the risks of using organic fertilizers is what happened in Sri Lanka. Because um, the use of the organic, they, they were pushing for organic fertilization of all the crops, but their, um, but the harvest hectare per yield is uh, le was lessened, so it did not really help um, the farmers in in um, the the trading of their goods and the harvests. But uh, what we would want to do is also make use of that, especially now that um, that uh, this is an opportunity for a lot of uh, those who are interested in climate smart agriculture is investing in organic locally sourced organic fertilizers in their countries. So what we're, uh, what we're doing right now is from our, the food wastage from our farmers, we're trying to compose that. And then from there, uh, and then um, the, the, a lot of the crops that could not be um, absorbed by the market, they can be turned to compost. And um, one of the, the president of PPSA, Ami, also suggested using sludge from, high, uh, from water dams to also use as fertilizers for, for this kind of um. So those are just some of the solutions that we're looking into when we um, look into the risks and opportunities of using organic fertilizers for our climate smart investments portfolio. Thanks so much, Sharon. I think there are a lot of good keywords from both Cam and Sharon in terms of uh, with respect to climate smart investments. I think in totality, there's a certain notion of circularity as well and the business model to see it as an opportunity and yeah great awesome um i'll we have a couple more minutes for to close the session so for those who have um and answered questions on the chat um we've don't worry we've take that all in 
and uh, sorry, I think I have uh, one hand raised from Max. Yes, Max, go ahead. Yes, Borja, I saw a question from Lo Luis or Loy. And in addition to the responses of Dada and, and Emma of FAO, I just want to also point out six important points moving forward from the CESO perspective. One is the need for a continued awareness raising on these important guidelines, such as the ASEAN RAI guidelines, especially at the local level, at the uh, uh, among the rural communities and among the local governments. The next one is to contribute or participate to advancing, reviewing, or amending national policies and programs that are supportive of RAI or that are that supports RAI. So and the third is to continue engaging multi-stakeholders, especially for us CSOs to engage public and private sectors. We should be able to maximize existing engagement mechanisms, multi-stakeholder mechanisms at the country level. There are several existing mechanisms at the ASEAN member states. We should be able to maximize those. Uh, next is to, re we also recommend expanding the existing uh, global and regional discourses. We have this regular global and regional forum or uh, this um, workshops, consultations on RAI, and we need to sustain, we need to expand these discourses as a regular multi-stakeholder mechanisms for us to share and exchange models, policies, and programs on responsible agri-investment. But more importantly, we need to ensure that this is the discussions and agreements made in these global and regional mechanisms have concrete tractions on the ground. And lastly, we propose to have mechanisms at the local levels, but at the ASEAN member states level, mechanisms for promoting or monitoring so or social accountability on ASEAN guidelines on RAI implementation. So that would be all, George. Thanks so much, Max, for that and i think that's actually a good close for the q a part or the open forum part of this session thank you all so much for your questions and for our panelists now before we close i'll pass it to uh dada again to give us a closing remarks and to have some of the key messages we've gathered from this session today thank you and over to you dada Thank you very much, Boris. And it's been, wow, it's been a very exciting uh, conversation, right? Um, I think, and I think we have a lot of uh, participants as well. And the chat box has been um, full of questions and discussions. And I was turning philosophical in some of the answers. <laughs> um, but uh, I would like to mention some key takeaways that really struck me most. Uh, Professor Jamal's um, um, sharing really points towards the importance of building enabling environments for investments. He mentioned uh, land tenure, security of tenure, which is uh, really part of the risking investments. Um, Harris, uh, Dr. Harris from Malaysia, really uh, mentioned the GCF proposal. Really, we're very proud of it as one of the first successful regional one. Uh, and it's going to work towards science-backed business plans. So in order to attract these investments, we really need to be guided by climate foresight and not just climate foresight, demand foresight as, it, as impacted by climate impacts. And, and um, the sharing from Kunkam really struck me the most, especially when we're looking at impacts at scale. The role of the private sector in order to magnify impacts is very, very important here, and we really need to consider that. And, and the role of Moringa for Morination, sorry, Moringa, Morination really also exemplifies the importance of small scale and grassroots farmers. These are the frontliners for, who are um, facing the impacts of unsustainable practices and the impacts of climate change. And therefore, I see them as innovators because frontliners will definitely be the one coming up with innovation. From Mags from Asia Dra, 
You know, Max, what, uh, what really struck me from all of Asia Dra's um, sharing is always the message from Marlene that says, and, and what you have echoed today, which is that farmers implementing policies versus crafted for them versus farmers uh, implementing policies crafted by them. And I think with your, with your continuous call for inclusivity, um, this, this should be reflected in terms of attracting the right responsible and climate smart investments. So circling back to the guidelines, and I know I have some script here to really mention, um, the guideline, the, the formulation of any guideline having worked with ASEAN for 10 years now is some sort of like a fairy tale story with lots of bureaucratic nightmare, right? Um, it is, it, it, the, the formulation or the adoption of a guideline, the existence of a guideline is just the first step. But even if it's the first step, there's a lot of efforts that went behind it. Um, so many stakeholders have been involved, so much funds as well. Technical expertise have, have been, have been uh, tapped. And for me, the best guideline for, for the region is that after working with ASEAN for 10 years is the one that really reflects best practices and that act, are able to bring diverse range of players and stakeholders together. And we are seeing this now, but there's more to do. Okay, now I'm gonna stick to my script. Each stakeholders that we've seen today, governments, investors, civil society organizations, we all know that there's important roles to play. And in playing these roles, being supported with innovative tools, approaches, and projects to assist governments to create enabling legal and policy frameworks to attract the kind of investment that we're all talking about today, right? Which is responsible, and climate smart investments. And these guidelines play this role. But beyond this also, I would like to go back to a message that I wrote in on the chat box, is that the larger task is really collaboration and coordination and connecting all the dots. Um, a guideline I think is a summary of best practices, existing initiatives compelling us to rise above what we are having right now and to jointly move together. So the call really for us is to connect all the dots and have all the innovators, the science people, the CSOs to all work together. So without taking so much more time, I would like to invite the audience to please, all participants to please get in touch with us, all the stakeholders that are here and the organizers to learn more about the various initiatives discussed. I think this is a group of people that have come together and shown um, a big uh, propensity for collaboration. So with that, Porsche, I would like to end my summary of key takeaways and thank all the participants for actively listening and being with us. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Dada, for uh, that inspirational message. I think we all uh, will take that with us and move along the multi-stakeholder approaches for responsible investments um, and climate smart investments in the region and hoping to work with more more of you. Some of you are working together now, but more, 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 uh, more hands together and collaboration is the last, uh, I think, the key takeaway for this session. Thanks so much, Dada, and thanks everyone for joining us. We're a bit over time, but we'd like to thank you all for joining us in this session. And there are other sessions in the C CFS um, side events as well ongoing, so you can join that as well. On behalf of um, the ASEAN Secretariat, Grow Asia, International Institute for Sustainable Development, GAXA, ASEAN Climate Resilience Network, we'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Thanks so much. Good night, good afternoon, and have a great week ahead. Thank you so much.